please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Anthony Wagner. Hey, thank, thank you, uh, Jennifer, for that kind introduction, as well as for the invitation to be here today. It's a real honor to um, spend time uh, and share uh, some of our science with you. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, my lab, we're, we're essentially a learning and memory lab. What, we're try, what we try to understand is the mechanisms, both the psychological mechanisms and the neural mechanisms that allow us to build memories of everyday life events such as this one, and then to reinstate them, uh, to travel back in time, both mentally and neurally, uh, to that moment uh, in the past and bring that knowledge forward in order to sort of shape your thinking, uh, decision making, your actions. And so as part of our work, um, again, we spent a lot of time trying to understand how we build and retrieve memories, and I could tell you lots of stories about sort of mental and neural time travel, where false memories come from. Uh, that typically would be the kind of thing that I would do and talk about. Um, in some of our work in trying to understand uh, how we build and retrieve memories, we've uh, come to appreciate the importance of attention for learning and for remembering. Uh, at, and so we've done basic work trying to look at the intersection between attention and memory, and I'll allude to a little bit of that today, and as well as work on what are the mechanisms that are brought online when we attempt to multitask. Other work in the lab is focused on sort of the aging brain and trying to understand what's going on in both healthy cognitive aging as well as uh, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, catching individuals early and trying to sort of see if we can predict using psychological or behavioral markers, neural markers, molecular markers, who might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease in the coming decade or so. So I could tell you stories in any of these pots, many other pots, but I'm going to tell you kind of a different story for me, given the kind of science scientist that I am. And I'm here telling this story because of my late colleague, uh, Cliff Nass, uh, who was in the Department of Communication. And he showed up in my office with uh, sort of a common uh, a master's student uh, who was working in his lab, in my lab, around 11 or 12 years ago. And they were fascinated with trying to do new science to understand the relationship between the sort of emerging, exploding digital media culture and cognition. Uh, and so to kick off and to frame sort of some of these issues and to frame the student that we, students and the kinds of students we were seeing uh, a decade and a bit ago, and undoubtedly you are seeing in yourself, in your uh, loved ones. I'm going to play a brief uh, a clip from, uh, it's about three minutes, from uh, Frontline that I think nicely introduces some of the topics that we'll cover you today. You are talking to your friend at the same time you're talking to your other friend, same time you're emailing another friend about what you're going to do tomorrow night. Your classes here are fun, man. We kind of understand that, too, between each other. We're all so busy that it's okay if I'm talking to Murph right now and his Blackberry goes off and he has to start going on. I'm like, well, that's okay because I'm going to do that to him anyway. So you just it's a mutual understanding. Where are the girls tonight? School, I think, is just kind of the same. Like, you're paying attention in class with your professor, you're emailing another professor, and you're looking at something else. Approach. Nobody who's been teaching for 25 years would say that our students aren't different now than they were then. I mean, they need, they need to be stimulated in ways they didn't need to be stimulated before. Sherry Turkle has been teaching at MIT for more than 30 years. Every professor who looks out onto a sea of students these days knows there's email, Facebook, Googling me, Googling them, Googling their next door neighbor that's happening in the classroom. Like most universities, MIT allows laptops in its classes at the professor's discretion. I mean, it even changes how teachers teach because now the, the pressure is on teaching kind of scintillating PowerPoint things that will distract them from the web. So you've hit on most of the, on the key points. There are two sorts of things you can test students about. You can test how well they're paying attention in lecture, and you can test how well they're absorbing information from readings that you assign. And I don't think they're doing either of those things well. I have no idea how that's possible. I just gave my class a midterm. And I was really asking obvious questions that had they been attending carefully in lecture and had they been doing the readings carefully, everyone should have gotten 100% on this exam. And the mean score was probably about a 75%. It's not that the students are dumb. It's not that they're not trying. I think they're trying in a way that's not as effective as it could be because they're distracted by everything else. So I teach at MIT. I teach the most brilliant students in the world. But they have done themselves a disservice by drinking the Kool-Aid and believing that a multitasking learning environment will serve their best purposes. There really are important things you cannot think about unless it's still 
and you're only thinking about one thing at a time. There are just some things that are not amenable to being thought about in conjunction with 15 other things. That well, I have 25 in the last 15 minutes. I, I feel are. like the professors like here do have to accept that we can multitask very well and that we do at all times. And so if they try and, you know, restrict us from doing it, it's almost unfair because we are completely capable of moving in between lecture and other things and just keeping track of the many things that are going on in our lives. No one's actually measured whether these kids are as successful at multitasking as they claim to be. But out in California, a respected research lab is studying their counterparts on the Stanford campus in Palo Alto. You know, they understand the research, they're smart kids, but they seem utterly convinced it doesn't apply to them. So we want to study what's really going on in the brain. The MRI studies we're going to be seeing, when it comes to what parts of the brain, we know nothing. These are really the first studies of brain imaging of multitaskers versus non-multitaskers. So anything we discover here is new, because we know zero. So I like that you know, three, three minute piece or so, because it introduces a number of the things that um, many of us un undoubtedly see, you see in your, maybe yourself, maybe you believe that you're now a super tasker and you can multitask uh, at will. Maybe you see it in your partner, uh, your husband or wife, maybe you see it in your uh, children, grandchildren. Uh, and um, when I talk about the science that I'm gonna share now uh, to the undergraduates uh, that I teach at Stanford, many of them are like the student uh, that we uh, heard from uh, from MIT where they're convinced that uh, because they've grown up in a multitasking environment uh, from uh, an early age, that they're fundamentally different and they've acquired uh, a skill set that allows them to um, overcome perhaps some of the limitations that earlier generations might have uh, uh, faced. So let's see where we, uh, what the science tells us. So uh, Cliff, I think, uh, and uh, uh, our student Ayala Ophir, uh, were reacting to sort of this explosion as smartphones were beginning to appear on the scene, social media. Uh, the amount of time uh, students and individuals were spending uh, uh, on media was just exploding. Uh, surveys back uh, in 2010 suggested that the cumulative number of hours uh, in a typical day that an average American youth, and this is also observed in other uh, cultures, is 11 cumulative hours. You can't get 11 cumulative hours in a day as well as go to school and sleep if those cumulative hours aren't using media concurrently, or at least attempting to use media concurrently. Even seen uh, in uh, uh, younger children, the emergence and a small percentage of them of attempts to begin to try to multitask with media, uh, again, at a, a fairly young age. And there's a lot of hype, a lot of concern on this particular topic. When uh, Cliff uh, would do a lecture like this, I would say he was um, at times uh, a little further on the hype than I might be tonight. Uh, there's a lot of hype, a lot of concern. What are the data? As a science, it's early days, and I'll share with you what we know, but I also want to sort of stress it's early days. The hype and the concern, uh, are we causing, are, is this sort of attempts to multitask? Is it causing sort of attentional or other cognitive deficits in ourselves and our children? Is it altering sort of brain development uh, as younger and younger children are attempting to multitask with uh, digital media, uh, affecting our cognition and our neural, neural function? I know it's con a confound. Uh, but as I've gone old, I've gotten older, so it's a confound with me growing older, uh, co-occurring with my aging has been this explosion of the ability to sort of multitask or attempt to multitask with media. And I subjectively feel that my ability to sort of sustain attention has changed through time. Perhaps that's aging and I'm trying to sort of pin it on something else, who knows? Uh, but many of us have these concerns. What are the data? So here's the roadmap for today. I'm going to talk first a bit about multitasking, and it's kind of a misnomer. We really, in most contexts, we don't multitask. The human mind uh, is not really architecturally positioned to multitask. So we'll talk briefly, or for uh, maybe about 10, 15 minutes on multitasking. Then I'll uh, describe to you this um, uh, method that Cliff and I.L. sort of brought, uh, developed, uh, and brought forward to the field to try to quantify or measure an individual sort of media multitasking sort of style or behavior in everyday life. We'll, we'll then talk about how cognition may or may not vary as a function of multitasking, media multitasking. 
I'll introduce a hypothesis that my lab has, been, has put forth um, uh, and uh, some new data that bear on that hypothesis as it relates to cognition and media multitasking. And then I'll highlight the many challenges and open questions. There is many, if not more, open questions than there are sort of answered questions. All right, so multitasking. You heard that student in the video. Uh, many of us claim, boy, you know, it, in my life today, I'm constantly now having to multitask. I'm constantly doing multiple things at any one moment in time. That's really a, a misnomer, as mentioned a moment ago. We might think we're multitasking, but we're not. <laughs> what we're doing is we're in a, in a regular, when we attempt to multitask, we're, we're in a state of task switching. We do one task for a brief period of time, then we shift, we try to load in the rules, the goals for the next task, load in the rules that govern how we're going to perform on that task, and we try to work on that task, and then we quickly shift back to try to do a little bit of work on the first task, and we're, we're flipping back and forth. Effective multitasking, it's really a myth. Uh, multitasking is task switching. And what do we know about task switching? There's decades worth of behavioral psychological science on task switching, and pretty much all of it says task switching is an ineffective way to navigate life. Uh, in the lab, we boil this down to very simple sort of paradigms, uh, and the effects are robust and uh, almost impossible not to find. You have to be a remarkably incompetent scientist to not get a, a cost when you have students, uh, or when you have subjects task switch. And when you scale it up to the complex real world tasks that we're doing in life, the, the costs are largely larger than what we see in the lab with these very simplified paradigms. So what do I mean by task switching? Imagine you're moving forward in time and you're doing at time one, task one, say you're doing in, in the lab, you're doing a particular trial of a particular simple decision-making task that we might ask a, a, a subject to do. And then time moves forward and you get to time two. And in the task repeat condition, you do another trial. You, do an, you stay on task one and you do another trial. And what we're interested here in is how long does it take for this individual to perform this trial as a function of what preceded that trial. So in the task repeat case, you're doing task one, and now you're doing task one again. And of course, in the task switch case, you were doing a different task on the immediately preceding trial. And now you switch, switch into task one, and you try to do a trial of task one. And what's cartooned here is that the amount of time it takes to do that simple trial, of that single trial of task one, is always significantly longer than the amount of time it would take to do that exact same trial if it were here, preceded by task one, if you didn't have to switch your tasks. And this increase in reaction time, this slowing, this inefficiency in performance is what we call the switch cost. There's a cost when you're trying to uh, switch back and forth between multiple tasks. Uh, and again, it's, you, you can reduce it in, in a number of ways, but you cannot eliminate the switch cost. We're slower and we're less accurate when we're switching than when we're staying focused on a single task. Are there other costs of multitasking, quote unquote multitasking? Now there's one context in which I'm gonna suspect a number of folks in this room were multitasking maybe only 15, 20 minutes ago. We, many individuals multitask in that context. Um, and we'll get there in just one moment, but to, to think about if there are other um, costs of multitasking, we first need to think about one fundamental form or, or, or aspect of cognition that's really critical for our ability to engage in a goal-directed manner, to interact with the world, to perceive the things out there in the world that are relevant to our goal, to select them, to act on them in order to achieve our goal. And this has to do with sort of our attentional capabilities, what we're going to call selective attention or goal-directed selective attention. The great psychologist William James described attention uh, uh, as follows. Attention is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or train of, trains of thought. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. This is sort of this metaphor that attention can be focused on and can kind of hide a lot, highlight goal-relevant inputs external inputs or goal-relevant representations that are already active in mind, such as memories. So we can focus attention on a subset, subset of possible information. James goes on, and this is sort of a critical part of and function of attention. This focusing of attention implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. 
It's this notion that attention selects a subset of the input, a subset of our thoughts, filters out goal-irrelevant information, and therefore allows us through that selection process to engage in an efficient manner uh, and uh, achieve our goals. Okay. Some of you may have uh, uh, seen this video. Uh, if not, um, uh, for those, uh, if, if you have, uh, uh, bite your uh, tongue. Uh, if you haven't, um, please play along at home or here with me. Um, so I'm going to play you a very brief clip of a selection attention task, and I would like you to perform the task. So what you're going to see uh, as the clip is going to start is a number of um, uh, students, some wearing black shirts, others wearing white uh, shirts, passing a, ba passing a basketball. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did many you passes? count? 14, is that? The correct answer 15. is 15 passes. All right, great. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> how, many folks, how many folks did not see a gorilla? OK, so maybe about a third or half of the. This video is from research by So what's going on here? This is, you know, it's a it's a powerful demonstration of what James uh, was essentially telling us, right? That by focusing attention on the relevant stimuli, selecting the goal relevant features, the white shirts, the the white team and attending to what they were doing, you were both uh, perceiving them presumably more effectively than if you didn't focus attention on the, on the white team, but you were also withdrawing attention. You were filtering out the other stimuli, the black team, and it happened to be that the gorilla was in black and you filtered out the gorilla as well, right? Uh, and sort of this has been dubbed this notion of inattention blindness, that by focusing attention and our attentional capacities are limited by focusing attention on goal relevant things, we are able to filter out distracting inputs, and that allows us to achieve our goals effectively. Well, that's great, unless one of the goals that we're trying to achieve is a secondary task, a task that we're multitasking, and by performing and focusing attention on the stimuli that are relevant for that task, we're in it, we're, we essentially suffer inattention blindness for other stimuli for the secondary tasks that might be kind of critical. I suspect nobody had a, a number of drinks uh, prior to driving here, at least uh, to the level of being legally intoxicated. But it may well be, and I'm not going to ask anybody to out themselves, that some of you may have actually held your phone and used it, hopefully not to text, but even to hand, you know, holding it to take a call to do something else with it. That dual tasking, that attempt to multitask with your phone, in st repeated studies, uh, has been shown to essentially give rise to remarkable inattention blindness. You are as bad, if not worse, than in a drunk driver when you're using your cell phone while you're driving. The data are unambiguous. No matter how many of us believe, just like that undergraduate believed, I've been doing this for a while now. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't crashed my car. I'm able to do this. I know how to do it. We are, many of us have convinced ourselves, just like that undergraduate has convinced herself, that she can multitask. What about hands-free cell phones? Great. That's going to sort of liberate us from this problem. The data are just about the same. A little bit better, but it's not great. Under situations where 
unexpected stimuli appear in the environment, you are just as bad or worse than somebody who's intoxicated to catch that kid running out after the basketball or soccer ball, soccer ball into the road, to see the child uh, in the stroller with her mother walking across the crosswalk. Uh, very powerful work by David Strayer uh, and colleagues at the University of Utah, many others. You, what's going on? Why do we believe it's inattention blindness? You're in a car simulator. You're either not on your phone. You're driving along. There's all kinds of activity on the road. There's sort of a family over here. There's a stop sign. My apologies for the low resolution image. There you might, you know, there's things that you might be needing to or, uh, or want to attend to in the rear view mirror. There's this bicyclist suddenly coming into the road. And here's the eye looking pattern, the saccades of the individual when they're not on the phone. They're, they're picking this information up. They're detecting it. They're perceiving it. They're, they're shifting to it and reacting to it. What about when you're on the phone? It's as if those stimuli aren't there. We fail to notice, we fail to attend to. All this information is landing on the retina, but the, just like that gorilla landed on the retina. But we fail to focus attention or be able to shift attention to those stimuli. It's as if they're not there. Twice as likely to miss a tra traffic signal so when you, uh, in fact, detect uh, the relevant stimulus. When you're single tasking, you're still significantly faster than when you're dual tasking with your cell phone. Automobile companies are uh, bringing additional technology forward. So again, this is just making the, the point. It's as if by dual tasking with our phones, by trying to uh, multitask with our phones in the car, we are frequently suffering from inattentional blindness. We're only aware of that when some tragic event happens. Otherwise, we land at home and we believe, yes, I'm a powerful multitasker. I can do this. I've done it. 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, and I've never hit anybody or crashed my car. Car companies are putting in voice-activated systems, the data on voice-activated systems. They cannot, just like the person on the cell phone, cannot see the driving conditions. They cannot jointly react and change their interaction with you. These automated systems, they don't know the state of the world, at least not the current ones. And so you are having this dialogue with these voice-activated systems and they're distracting you and creating significant multitasking problems. The science on um, multitasking behind the wheel is wonderfully reviewed in this book by Matt, Matt Richtel. Uh, that begins with a, a very uh, one of countless tragic uh, real human stories about a, an individual who um, was texting, ended up killing. Um, uh, other individuals, and then becomes an advocate uh, to try to um, convince others and to have laws passed to remove uh, cell phones from, uh, from cars. All right. There are yet other costs of multitasking. When you're trying to multitask, you're not really necessarily processing the other channel as deeply and as meaningfully. You're not understanding what's going on. And the kinds of memories that you build Here's sort of your brain when you're single tasking, doing a particular task, and there's activation and sort of this critical memory circuit, the hippocampus and surrounding uh, medial temporal cortical structures that are, is fundamentally important for building rich memories of everyday life events that you can then use in the future in a flexible manner. When individuals are performing a task alone, uh, there was a greater activation in the hippocampus than when they were dual tasking, and when they were dual tasking, uh, this one study suggests that they were engaging circuits that essentially allowed them to build sort of habitual-like memories, less flex flexible memories, not consciously accessible. So even if you're performing the task now, two concurrent tasks well, you're likely laying down different kinds of memories. Perhaps not the kinds of memories, this is sort of the system that you'll need to remember that content in lecture, uh, to remember uh, uh, some meaningful interaction you had with somebody. All right. Sounds very doom and gloom. Uh, with respect to multitasking uh, and uh, performance, eh, the data are somewhat inescapable. Um, you pay a cost. Slower, you're less accurate, often will study, uh, suffer inattentional blindness, you might fail to act on important information, it's gonna disrupt learning, it's gonna change um, uh, also what we learn. When I talk about sort of 
computers in, my, in, in the classroom on the first day of my introduct introductory course on learning and memory. Uh, it's wonderful to see the reaction of the students when you share out the science on multitasking, including with computers, in the classroom, and you share it out in a particular manner. I don't think that they're persuaded by the argument that they can't actually learn while multitasking. But I, my students seem to consistently pers be persuaded by the data that show that if you're multitasking with your computer, you are disrupting the learning of your classmate who can see your computer and are distracted by your computer. And so students consistently put away their, their uh, laptops unless they're using it solely to largely to look at uh, lecture slides. Uh, it's a great sort of pro-social response that, well, I may be superhuman, but I don't want to rob my uh, colleague uh, here, my, my peer, of the opportunity to learn. All right, but everything that I've told you isn't really what Cliff was after when he showed up in my sort of office. And it's not really uh, directly speaking to this question, which, you know, as technology sort of um, emerge over the decades, uh, uh, it's a frequent question and concern. Is this new technology creating a challenge for the human cognitive system and for the human mind and brain? that causing attentional or other cognitive deficits. What's typically meant by that is, is it changing my child, changing me, in some more durable way? Yeah, okay. If, my, if I or my child multitasks while trying to learn something, they're not gonna learn as well. I get that. But it's perhaps even more troubling if it's changing us in a manner that changes what we can achieve even when we're single tasking, even when we're trying to do a single thing. Is there some fundamental change in our attentional capabilities or other cognitive systems? Are we altering brain development um, uh, and brain function? And so this was the question that Cliff showed up in my office uh, asking. Does chronic, chronic just meaning over the flow of time in everyday life, Multitasking with media, is that changing cognition in some more trait-like manner, more stable manner, disrupting, therefore, performance even when we're trying to do a single thing? So how might one go after this? Uh, Cliff and I developed uh, what has been come to be known as sort of the MMI or the Media Multitasking Index. I have to admit, when Cliff showed up in my office and, uh, and I.L., this very talented master's, uh, um, uh, co-term master's student, I was very skeptical. Uh, one, this is a self-report measure that's asking individuals to report how many hours in a typical week they use each of 12 different kind of media. And when they're using each of those uh, 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 types of media, how frequently they're engaged with the other 11 types of media. I'm a memory scientist, it's a retrospective judgment, it's going to be, it's, a, it's undoubtedly a noisy measure. Nonetheless, they developed this measure. And then what they wanted to know is, it's not, they didn't really want to address the question of total screen time, just is more screen time bad? They wanted to know was media multitasking, was multitasking with multiple forms of media, is it correlated with uh, altered or differential cognitive function? So they wanted to measure how many types of media a Stanford student, because this was done, uh, this first study with Stanford undergrads, how many types of media are typically used in a, tip in a typical media use hour. So uh, once they computed that using this self-report measure, they examined how chronic media multitasking relates to single task performance. Uh, and again, this is distinct from learning while multitasking. So here in this first study, uh, I believe what Cliff did was just run the media multitasking uh, index, collect media multitasking data from 260 some odd students in his intro to communications uh, course at Stanford. And uh, on the x-axis is um, your multi, uh, media multitasking score. To the right means you're you know, trying to use multiple media in a given hour. To the left, there's some rare undergrads at Stanford who claim to single task all the time. <laughs> Maybe they thought we were going to report back to mom and dad, I don't know. Um, all right, but it's a normal distribution. 
And this is essentially what the field has been doing for the past decade or so, which is to run or collect data on the MMI and then do one of two kinds of analyses. Either look at the extreme groups, look at the up upper quartile and the lower quartile, and say, well, these are the heavier media multitaskers. These are the lighter media multitaskers. Let me bring back a subset of these folks and a subset of these folks, and let me have them do some cognitive tasks, and let me see if their behavior differs. Or you bring everybody in, and you do a continuous analysis, and you ask, is there some monotonic or linear relationship uh, between my cognitive measure and uh, MMI score? So let me tell you about where, what the state of the science is. Um, and first, starting with uh, the work that Cliff and, and I.L. had done. So you know, they had this hypothesis that heavier media multitaskers had a, have a different attentional scope, such that they were less likely to filter out distracting goal or relevant stimuli. Okay. And so uh, you know, their view is essentially you would see increased failures, reduced cognitive performance, behavioral performance, on tasks where there was greater demands on filtering out distractors. Okay. And so here's one of uh, seven different experiments. I won't do all seven uh, from this first uh, paper. There are seven different experiments because, in part, I.L. and Cliff would show up in my office, and they sort of initially engaged me on the first uh, few experiments that they had, had conducted. And, I scratched my head and kind of thought, again, this seemed kind of flaky, a little, uh, you know, really? Is this, uh, uh, it, you know, engaging with our media is going to give rise to um, fundamental changes in cognitive performance? I, I don't know about that. You've got this self-report measure, which is going to be noisy. That seems like hard science to do, even if, it's, if there's a there there. So they did a few experiments. Then I sort of, OK, that's interesting. I, I might suggest these additional paradigms. Uh, from my sub-literature, they went off and did them, and we ended up with seven experiments that roughly told the same story. So here's one task. It's a perceptual filtering task you, you, um, that requires you to um, understand the rules of the game, the rule of the task, remember the rule, apply that rule to an upcoming stimulus, uh, and then move on to the next trial. So it's called the AXCPT task. Uh, CPT is just continuous performance. It just means trials are coming one after the other. And on any given trial, there are two stimuli. One stimulus appears initially, then there's a delay here, uh, approximately five seconds, and then there's a second stimulus. The task is very simple. The rule is very simple. Press the button, respond whenever you see an X that was preceded by an A. All, there, all other times you see an X, don't respond. All other letters, that are the second uh, uh, stimulus that aren't an X, don't respond. Very simple tasks. Students, you know, subjects can do it fairly quickly, fairly accurately. And uh, so there's this sort of uh, no distractor. So here's one trial, and then the task continues. Here's another trial, so the subject would respond here and not there. And there was a dis no distractor version of the, of the task, and then there was a distractor version of the task. They get the, the cue, the context cue. They have to remember the context cue during a, a, a filled delay period in which they're getting goal-irrelevant distractors. They knew they were irrelevant because they were in white, not in red. And then the, um, uh, the probe stimulus showed up. And what uh, was observed was that uh, the, lower, the low media or the light media multitaskers outperformed the heavier media multitaskers when there were distractors present. They were faster, significantly faster, relative to the heavier media multitaskers, as if the heavier media multitaskers were being distracted by the intervening items, and that was sort of slowing down their performance. There were other uh, experiments uh, in this initial paper uh, where there was sort of competition or perhaps distraction or interference in memory. Here's another sort of uh, uh, working memory task. Subjects are getting uh, individual letters one at a time, and here they had to respond yes whenever the current letter appeared three trials back. So kind of a complex task because every trial you have to make a response, yes or no. You have to compare it to a running, updated internal representation of the stimuli you've recently encountered. 
Once you've made a response, you need to drop that item out. You need to re-update, reorder the stimuli that are active in mind, and prepare for the next trial. And uh, what was observed, uh, and so you can have um, uh, uh, hits. That is an item that is appearing now that uh, indeed appeared three trials back. You can also have false alarms. This is a probe that appeared recently, but not three trials back. It's going to give rise to this sense of familiarity, but you need to kind of remember, oh, yeah, that was something I encountered not three back, but at a different, uh, uh, a different delay back. Uh, and what uh, um, was observed in this initial work was, that, again, the heavier media multitaskers underperformed the light media multitaskers, and part, largely because they tended to false alarm to these familiar stimuli, as if they were getting these sort of memory signals coming at them, and they weren't filtering them out, selecting the right source for this sense of familiarity. Okay. And so in this first paper, uh, now a decade old, um, there were seven uh, experiments. And in, in all seven, the heavier media multitaskers underperformed the light media multitaskers. There have been subsequent, in the subsequent decade, there's been a number of follow-on experiments. Some like this one, where we essentially shared out all of our experiments uh, to this uh, 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 research team. Uh, and they attempted direct replications. Some of the effects replicated. Others didn't uh, replicate. The effect sizes uh, were the mean effect sizes were smaller than in the Ophir paper. But the mean effect sizes were in the moderate range across the seven tests in two replication uh, experiments by this research team. I go into this because the literature is, as the literature on screen use and many other sort of aspects of sort of this uh, important, you know, effort to use science to address this important question of how is the current digital culture and technology culture impacting or relating to cognition. The literature is thin, and the early experiments, they're low sample sizes. These, you know, the Ophir studies, which, you know, I'm a co-author on, some of those experiments had only 15 light media multitaskers and 18 or 19 heavier media multitaskers. The follow-on studies here by Weir and Honey and, and, and Neuenstein, they had in some experiments 10 or 11 in each group. Very underpowered science. An early peek at what could be going on, but the literature is, is a bit messy. I thought I was going to leave this story behind. Um, it was sort of an interesting uh, and I think important sort of collaborative experience with uh, Cliff and I out. Um, but as time moved on and my own work in, uh, the, the work in my own lab was increasingly focused on the importance of the role of attention in building new episodic memories, which is essentially the kind of cognition that my lab is sort of largely dedicated to. We turn back to and return to this question of um, what's the relationship between media multitasking and cognition. And we try, we've been trying to scale up, go to much larger, more powered uh, studies, larger ends, um, and hopefully a higher probability of um, uh, detecting uh, real effects that are there and perhaps not uh, suffering from uh, false positives. So let me tell you about two aspects of memory that our data and, and other um, uh, results in the literature uh, uh, are also sort of telling us differ in individuals who are heavier media multitaskers from individuals who are light media multitaskers. The first is keeping information in mind. That is working memory. Working memory is this fundamental, it's not a singular thing. It's multiple systems interacting. But it's this fundamental cognitive ability that we have as, uh, as organisms and that we use to navigate the world to bridge brief periods of time. Working memory is the interaction between essentially goal representations, what is relevant to me right now, attention, harnessing our attentional systems to select the relevant stimuli out there in the world, relevant in terms of what our goals are, and to then, when those stimuli disappear, to keep attention focused on our internal representations of those things that were just out there in the world, to keep those representations active in mind, to compute or work on them, such that at some point in the very near uh, term, maybe a second later, a few seconds later, you can use those active representations of what was just out there in the world 
in order to act, to think, uh, to decide, uh, to act. Working memory correlates with a lot of things we care about. Individual differences uh, uh, in working memory capacity correlate with reading comprehension and numeros uh, numeracy, with reasoning and problem solving, general intelligence, with academic success. Differences in working memory have the potential to have uh, real world consequences for us. They're not just sort of uh, assays in the lab that are unrelated to um, uh, sort of navigating our world as cognitive agents and succeeding and excelling. So in uh, some work a few years back with Melina Unkefer, who's now at UCSF, um, uh, we've conducted a couple of experiments examining simple working memory and its relationship to media multitasking. Here's one experiment, very simple. Uh, a trial consists of an, uh, a, a visual, a perceptual array, a very brief delay period of just about a second, and then a, a choice screen where you have to indicate, did something change between the external world a moment ago and the external world now. On these, uh, in this task, the subjects know what's relevant out there are the red rectangles. The white basketball team is the relevant team. Just attend to those stimuli. The blue rectangles, if there are any there, could be ignored. Uh, so, and the, the task is, did one of the red rectangles change orientation between the state of the world a moment ago and the state of the world now. And here's a no change trial, and here's a change trial where that rectangle changed orientation. It's a very common uh, uh, measure of uh, working memory in the literature. In a second experiment, we swapped out these stimuli and we went to more complex stimuli, these sort of line drawings of common objects. And again, the relevant stimuli were the red objects, and there could be a no change or a change here, smaller uh, degrees of rotation than with the rectangles. All right, so what did we observe? First thing we observed is that in both of these experiments, the heavier media multitaskers demonstrated lower working memory capacity than the lighter media multitaskers. We also didn't observe a clear effective number of distractors. On some trials, there were zero blue uh, rectangles. On others, two, four, or six, we didn't see a clear, we didn't see an interaction between media multitasking and distraction on these uh, particular uh, experiments, these particular tasks, and that's now been seen multiple times. So here, two different experiments, larger sample sizes, negative relationship between media multitasking and working memory capacity. And uh, in a smaller samples, uh, uh, in the study by Weir Radhani and Neuenstein, exact same thing was seen. Even though smaller samples, lighter media multitaskers, better working memory than heavier media multitaskers. And this has now been seen in a number of studies uh, in the literature. Given that working memory is relevant for reasoning problem solving, correlates with uh, uh, um, future academic performance, there's the potential here that these relationships might have some real world significance. What about episodic memory? The, uh, episodic memory, I've been alluding to it. Episodic memory is, and you know, I, I'm now this is what I spend my life largely trying to understand and focused on, and so it's a little bit self-serving, but episodic memory is fundamental to who we are. <clears throat> fundamental to our sense of self, to having a life narrative, to being able to learn and remember from, some, from a single interaction. You're using your episodic memory system now to build new memory traces, and you'll be able to report back to uh, a colleague tomorrow or a family member tonight what happened here at the Beckman Center because you were able to build new long-term episodic traces for this event and report them out. These forms of, this form of memory is consciously accessible, it captures the who, what, where, and when of our everyday experiences, it's central to our understanding of our life narrative, uh, and we know how central episodic memory is to us as cognitive agents because in the typical uh, individual who's suffering from Alzheimer's disease, episodic memory is the first uh, cognitive ability affected because of where the uh, plaques and tangles build up, which is in this sort of medial temporal lobe memory system. And uh, so one is um, robbed uh, of the ability to build new episodic memories. And initially, you have those awkward moments then of hearing the same story. Yes, you know, you told me that already, mom, et cetera. Um, and that transitions to 
being robbed of uh, being able to build a, a greater narrative arc of what's been going on in the recent days, months, years. And if you have any loved ones uh, are unfortunate to be unfortunate to have uh, been suffering from or uh, are currently suffering from Alzheimer's disease, you see the individual almost, the individual pulls back. Because if you don't know how you got to where you are, you don't know why you're having the interaction you're having, you lose confidence in yourself in, in, order, in, in terms of your ability to engage with the world. So what do we know about episodic memory and media multitasking? Also not uh, a, a positive relationship. In that uh, working memory experiment with common objects, what we did is um, an hour later, or following the experiment, we gave them a surprise long-term memory task, a test for the red objects. We asked them, do you recognize that stimulus as having been seen in the working memory task or not? Some of them were old, some were new. The heavier media multitaskers significantly underperformed the lighter media multitaskers. And we've recently replicated this in, a, uh, in another sample with a different paradigm. Uh, um, and so clearly a replicable effect. So let me tell you what's going to, you know, the, the working model that we have, and then I'll conclude with sort of open questions. Um, this is a hypothesis. It's speculative. Um, the working model we have is um, partly driven by the complexity of the literature. What you see in the literature is when pushed to the wall, when an individual is, comes into the lab and has to perform a very challenging task that is very attentionally demanding, the heavier media multitaskers don't underperform the lighter media multitaskers. And there are situations where there's kind of slack. The individual knows, I might have some sort of cognitive slack here. I might, I might be able to do reasonably well and not sort of pay a price. That's where we start to see underperformance. It's as if there's not really deeply a, a there's not a meaningful difference in uh, cognitive capability. There's a difference in the probability that an individual will be able to, under a situation where there's a little slack in the world, the world's not so clearly signaling, it's very demanding of attention right now, there's a higher probability that the heavier media multitaskers might have brief attentional lapses. They might just lose, they might just kind of, they're, they might lose track of their current goal. Attention might pull back a little bit. And they might be just ever so slightly underprepared to engage with the world. And therefore, they pay a small price in performance. Some could argue, and uh, you know, in an even more speculative mode, I have sort of uh, entertained the possibility of sort of this balance between being in an exploration versus exploitation sort of cognitive state. Uh, Exploitation is sort of this, I know what I need to do in order to navigate the world and to maximize my rewards. Exploration is allowing sort of that knowledge about what you need to do in order to get rewards to kind of not govern your behavior all the time, perhaps drop off for a moment, such that you can react to new things that you, through, through doing so, you might discover actually are a little more rewarding than the thing that you thought was maximizing reward. So we have this hypothesis that uh, there may be this um, uh, relationship between heavier media multitasking and the ability to maintain a goal state, the probability of maintaining, not the ability, the probability of maintaining a goal state and keeping attention focused. And that there's a slightly higher probability of losing attentional focus uh, in the heavier media multitaskers. All right, so I'm going to tell you it's a little bit of a few data points but um, some exciting new data, not published yet, where we think we're beginning to sort of um, test this hypothesis. HMMs are more likely to suffer lapses of attention, losing track of their goals, losing track of their goals, and therefore, as a consequence, goal-directed behavior and memory uh, might decline. How might we measure lapses of attention? The field, there's a number of attentional paradigms that are thought to give rise to or allow us to assay um, individual differences in the ability to sort of sustain attention. Here's one task. It's a gradual onset continuous performance task. All that means is, again, it's continuous performance. There's one stimulus after another. Here, the stimuli are morphing through time between scenes of cities and scenes of mountains. The task is very simple. The subject knows all I need to do is press a button whenever there's any evidence that there's anything city-like in the scene. Press 
press, 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 no city evidence, withhold response, press, press. It's rapidly paced. Subjects are instructed to go as quickly and as accurately as possible. In this task, you can <laughs> look at commission errors responding when the mountain, when it's 100% mountain. Uh, commission errors might be a marker that the subject suffered, the individual suffered a lapse of attention. Oh yeah, I, I you know, forgot what my, my goal was for a moment here and uh, responded when I shouldn't have. And reaction time variability, that is, um, how consistently timed are my responses, given that the task is, very, is specifically and uh, consistently timed, or how variable are my responses? And this reaction time variability <laughs> seems to be a marker of having these brief lapses of attention. You, you sort of drifted off for a brief moment, you came back, you, you win again, and so your RT on that trial, your reaction time, your response was a little bit slower. Okay, so what do we see? First, what we see is on that simple task, here's 80 subjects, have your media multitaskers on the uh, uh, media multitasking uh, going up on the x-axis. Commission errors responding when you shouldn't. You're more likely to uh, demonstrate a commission error if you're a heavier media multitasker. <coughs> your reaction time variability is also your re responses are going to be more variable. <coughs> Both of these potential markers of uh, lapses of increased probability of lapses of attention. And here, these are continuous analyses. And here the data broken up into the 20 uh, LMMs and the 20 HMMs. And again, you see clearly significantly higher commission errors, clearly significantly more variable responses. Concur in this experiment, we also had the subjects complete a whole bunch of, uh, a number of uh, self-report batteries. Heavier media multitasking is associated with higher self-reports of mind wandering in everyday life. Not in that task, just in everyday life. Higher probability of claiming I experience attentional lapses more frequently in everyday life. I uh, demonstrate it and suffer cognitive errors that I think are due to attentional lapses in everyday life. I demonstrate or my, I self-report to be more int intentionally impulsive. And I score higher on, uh, in terms of ADHD <coughs> symptoms on a standard ADHD battery. And I report, now this is not in our experiment, I report that out in the, in the world, I also suffer more memory failures. Okay, so HMMs are more likely, we think, these data show, to suffer uh, lapses, more frequent lapses of attention. Is there a relationship between those lapses of attention and altered or, uh, uh, or diminished episodic memory? Here uh, is the last experiment I'm reporting, I promise, last, last data point. Um, here in this uh, experiment with these 80 uh, uh, subjects, we had them do uh, uh, first a learning task where they made one of two different kinds of decisions, a conceptual decision. They decided whether on a given trial an object presented is pleasant or unpleasant. My daughter plays the piano. Piano is pleasant to me. Pleasant, they're arbitrary decisions, or bigger or smaller, a perceptual decision, bigger or smaller than a reference, a standard, a 13-inch box. So they're just simply just intending to stimuli in a goal-directed manner and encoding those stimuli into long-term memory. And then at retrieval, they perform one of three retrieval tasks. They indicate for some items, did I perform the pleasantness task before? Did I perform the perceptual task before? Is, an, is the stimulus new? And what we care about now is how is performance on, this ep, on these episodic memory tests relate to these trait measures of attention elapsing on the grad CPT? Individuals who suffer more frequent attention elapses on this completely different task, this grad CPT task, they show lower memory performance, episodic memory performance. And that's whether attentional lapses are measured using commission rates or reaction time variability. Heavier media multitaskers, heavier media multitasking is associated with worse episodic memory on all three of our tasks. And again, this is sort of treating the data continuously, and these are looking at the, the, um, the lightest and the heaviest media multitaskers, and you clearly see there's an episodic memory difference. The final observation is this relationship, this significant relationship between media multitasking and episodic memory performance, it's mediated through our trait measure of attentional lapsing. Part of the variance, part of this relationship between media multitasking and memory is explained by that individual, individual differences in the probability of suffering from attentional lapses. 
This is ongoing work. We're doing sort of brain imaging um, uh, measures of attentional lapsing, brain imaging measures of representing goal states uh, that during learning and during remembering. And we're trying to sort of build out uh, uh, this particular uh, theoretical um, sort of model. OK. So I recognize that I've been going for about 55 minutes. So I'm going to wrap up with open questions and challenges, just five minutes, and then we can turn it over to Q&A, where I'm, I'm certain uh, some of these open questions and challenges uh, will further uh, reveal themselves. All right, so what do we know? It is early days. It is very early days. The studies, the, la the latter studies that I showed you, and one or two other studies in the literature are the only studies where we have sample sizes that are larger than, say, 20 subjects per group. The literature is very young. Much more needs to be done uh, just to begin to just understand the relationships. Okay? So what are the relationships? We need more rigorous science. Um, we need more science, more studies. Uh, and we also need to relate not only sort of the uh, media multitasking uh, uh, behavioral measures uh, to cognition, but also to underlying uh, neural measures. Big open question. The, the most significant question, perhaps, but a, a very challenging question to address. What is the causal direction? Is it that I already, for whatever reason, um, show up in today's modern society where I have the opportunity to multitask? But I show up as an individual who happens to have a lower uh, ability to sort of sustain my attentional goals. I, I'm an individual for whatever reason. I'm more likely to suffer attentional lapses, and that leads me to be a heavier media multitasker? Or is it engagement with our screens and multitasking with media that's driving these cognitive and, and underlying neural changes? That is, from a societal and policy perspective, it's not the only question, but it seems like perhaps the critical question. It's very hard to do. It's hard to randomly assign my kid, your kid, to a heavier versus a lighter media multitasking environment uh, for some sustained period of time. Uh, and so that doing that science is tough. There's a couple of studies out there. We have a child study, late, late elementary school and, and middle school schoolers. And there's a, one other observation in the literature. Both of them accelerated longitudinal designs, which basically means you get a measure at time one in six months, or maybe 12 months later, you get a measure at time two, and you try to understand do the measures at time one predict what's going on at time two. In both of the, these, there's some evidence that pre-existing uh, states relate to multitasking behavior, and some uh, emerging evidence uh, in our study that the multitasking behavior, as it changes over uh, the 18 months, I believe we have, um, uh, uh, over the 18 months that we've collected data, that the change in multitasking behavior also <coughs> relates to changes in cognition. I suspect it will be both is going to be the answer rather than either or. But there's almost nothing on causality out there that needs to be done. Are there age effects? You know, the uh, American Academy of uh, Pediatrics has put out recommendations with respect to uh, screen use. What do we know about age effects if there is a causal direction uh, 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 from multitasking, media multitasking to altered cognition? Is it uh, particularly uh, risky to engage in such behavior as a younger individual uh, versus, say, an adult? What kinds of media matter in terms of uh, these effects? What are the relationships between multitasking with media and merely total amount of screen time. In our work, we factor out um, total screen time. They're correlated. It's correlated with media multitasking, but there's individual variants explained. But um, more needs to be done. Are there interventions? Some have begun to use mindfulness interventions to see if one can see changes in uh, tension and cognitive performance in the heavier versus lighter media multitaskers. And there's one data point out there that's suggestive. Um, more needs to be done there. And then finally, I'm not a kind of a doom and gloom kind of guy with respect to uh, media multitasking and cognition. I'm more in, uh, interested in just what are the data going to tell us and where, where is that going to lead us in terms of society, policy, et cetera. But are there positive effects? To the extent 
that this notion of exploration versus exploitation is right, that having a lapse of attention might mean we're more likely to be reactive to things that are out there that could be useful for us. Perhaps there will be contexts in which there will be more positive effects. Perhaps the heavier media multitasker might be more likely to detect that kid unexpectedly <laughs> popping out between the cars uh, running after a soccer ball. Before he passed away, I had heard from Cliff, uh, who had a, a, a car simulation lab, that they had a data point suggestive of that. I don't know that it's ever, it's appeared in the literature, and so I can't attest to that. But there are some contexts already in the literature where the heavier media multitaskers appear to outperform the light media multitaskers. And we should understand um, uh, that as well. All right, uh, last point, and this is really just me uh, getting on a soapbox here. Um, I hope what I've been able to do is convince you that through application of the scientific method, that science broadly and psychological and behavioral science uh, uh, is well positioned and powerful to speak to pressing societal problems and questions and to begin to make uh, progress that hopefully will inform us to uh, uh, hopefully uh, create uh, an environment that uh, maximizes um, success, health, uh, educational outcomes, et cetera, for, um, uh, for ourselves, our families, and our uh, society. Okay. The work, uh, I'm now an old man. The uh, frontline video from a decade ago, I don't think I had anywhere near as much gray hair. At least my children tell me my hair is now nothing but gray. The work was really done by my collaborators. As an old man, I just get to um, uh, work with them, uh, including my longtime collaborate, collaborator, Melina Unkefer, Cliff, of course, with IL, kicked off the work, and then a number of uh, students and postdocs in my lab and Melina's lab. Thank you for your attention. Uh, really appreciate it.